Uh, let's see. There we go. All right. Hey, good to see you. Hello. Good to see you as well. How are you doing today? Pretty well. Pretty well. Um, <clears throat> crazy, crazy life uh, that is, as normal. Do you mind if I record this as well? Because I, I like to keep keep record of my side as well. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, you're you're totally welcome to record it if you can. Otherwise, uh, like on Zoom, I'll record it and I can also send it over to you. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. So, so with knowledge without college, did, I I would assume that you didn't go to college yourself, or did you? Uh, I'm a college dropout, so I went to one year of college and dropped out to you know pursue entrepreneurship and business. Yeah. Sales, yeah. all that stuff. I actually don't know uh, about your college background. Did you go? I did. I did. Uh, I got up to a PhD in physics. Oh, that's certainly uh, some level of college. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Um, you you did see my TED talk, right? Yes. Yes. It was so, that's basically the inspiration for wanting to talk with you. Yeah, I did mention that uh, I got a PhD in plasma physics, and I decided I was use. I found out I was mm -hmm. useless. So that's that was kind of my my <laughs> takeaway from that. But, wow, that's yeah, that's a it's a long road to finding out that's useless and. Um, uh, you know, it's it's really I'm um, you know I just like love the sort of you know the uh, I always look at sort of what could the results of something be you know what could be the what could be like sort of a ten x multiplying factor that could dramatically change the way we live hmm. and the project that you're working on is uh, undoubtedly sort of falls in that category and so definitely and sort of sparks my interest definitely definitely and I think interesting times these are like with the COVID and the whole global upheaval it's a good time for us I would say. In terms of providing real solutions, one thing we're actually working on is in a house project to def deliver an affordable house. I can talk more about that, but that's one of the things that we shifted to. Like next year, we're going to do this major, major project on affordable housing that you can basically a uh, thousand square foot house that you can build with a friend for fifty thousand dollars in a week. Wow! Yeah, I love that. I'd love to hear about that. What do you have anything else uh, on the horizon that you'd like to speak about? Uh, you know, um, on our talk today. That's the main thing on the immediate horizon. But also, there's uh, we're also doing one remote Steam camp next month. So actually, when would this thing get published? When when would this podcast be published? Uh, it would be published in not this coming Monday, but the following Monday. So that will be time because uh, next month we're going to run a remote Steam camp where we're going to ship out kits so that people build their own 3D printer. And build their own microcontroller and experiment with 3D printed electric motors, things like that. Oh, yeah. very cool. Where is that happening? Well, that's we're shipping the kits, so this is just remote. So wherever, oh, oh, wherever, shipping the kits. Shipping okay, the yeah, kits. I, yeah, I yeah. Got it. Okay, mm -hmm. very cool. That's awesome. I love that. Um, yeah. All right, uh, and then uh, do you have a, a hard deadline at five o'clock, or is there? No. No, I'm okay. No hard. You're deadline. good. If we end up going a little over. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, um, and um, yeah, we got everything that I need to know on my end. So, without further delay, I'll just say, it, "Am I pronouncing your name correctly?" Marching. Just say, uh, "Marchin." Yep, marching to the yeah. rhythm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, all right, let's let's dive in. I'll say, "Hey, Marchin, thanks for joining us, and we'll be live." That's let's do it. Or not live, but recording. Yeah. Yep, and um, also one last thing I'll mention that if we if you do notice it like if the uh, you know if we get a little choppy throughout you know if we see some internet issues um, sometimes if I see that I may cut the video and you're welcome to do so as well that okay. way we can just preserve bandwidth on the audio okay no problem. okay cool but we'll see how it goes sometimes we have perfect internet yep all right excellent let's do this hey Martin thank you so much for joining us today it's an honor to have you on the show thank you let's dive in Let's do it. So for the audience out there who maybe is unfamiliar with your work right now, would you mind giving them a little bit of background about yourself and what you're currently working on? Yep. So I started Open Source Ecology. So we've got a project called, uh, we're working on a global village construction set. It's essentially a set of the 50 different machines it takes for modern life to exist that we create an open source and develop that so that people can apply that to uh, any kind of purpose like starting a, a business, a small farm, or any other enterprise. But basically, open uh, the greater picture of this is developing collaborative methods where we develop real pl products in a collaborative way. So if you, if you haven't seen, do look at, look at the four-minute TED Talk that summarizes this. But we build things like tractors, circuit makers, bread ovens, and all, all the different things that are required to 
lead a modern standard of living. So it's a it's completely open source, so you can download the blueprints and build things like tractors or houses. It's a brief overview. It's incredible, and I'm looking right now. There's like a grid image of all the different machines, and it's it's quite remarkable to to uh, think about what could be possible with sort of these you know starting points for you know the building blocks for modern life. How did you get to this point? What what was in your background that led you to you know even getting to this idea and putting so much energy and effort into this project. It's been almost two decade, decades now, right? Yeah, 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 almost two decades. So started in 2004 on the actual idea. Now, what was this about? So my background is um, came from Poland when I was 10. My father's a scientist. I always thought about good things to do with science. So then I pursued that. I pursued chemistry in college and then actually physics. I got up to a physics PhD. I really discovered that was useless and I didn't have the practical skills the as the farther I went in my my schooling the less useful I felt I was in terms of making impact on pressing world issues so I started the project now during the college time what really changed me was the just observing how things work so I studied fusion energy it's the stuff that goes on in the Sun the source of all energy we get on earth so we're trying to create fusion on earth but um, when um, I looked into it more and more, it was, and the farther I went in the research, we were doing things that didn't have applications immediately and, and it didn't seem like this would solve any issues. And even in the classes, you, I went to a professor once asking about this long equation I saw and, and asking, well, what does this really mean that this is so abstract? And I was told that, well, this actually doesn't exist. I just made it up. And it's things like that. We're, we're studying such abstract things in our, in our curriculum, but there are real pressing world issues. So I wanted to do something about that. And, and after observing that we don't really collaborate in, um, in academia even, um, I mean, what, I could not talk openly about the work that I was doing because we had some hot material. I mean, obviously, if, if you reveal your your work to somebody, they publish papers, they get funding in front of you, that kind of competitive deal. Um, so the deal was I couldn't talk openly about what I was doing and I felt that was such a waste and I started envisioning what it would look like if we truly collaborated and did things in a different way. And someone introduced me to Linux at one point in a college career and I was like, wow, this is a different operating system. It's not Windows mm -hmm. or Mac. It's a thing you can download for free, you can modify it, you can do what you want and, and it's even free. So my mind was open, hey, there's other options out there as well. So all these things combined made me think, okay, let's let's start this. I'm, I'm done with academia. Let's start, get a plot of land and start a civilization reboot experiment. That's incredible. And it's, and it is so interesting to think about how the, the structure of academia sort of creates that environment, creates sort of a bubble where uh, collaboration is not highly encouraged because of how competitive it is. People spend their entire careers trying to make some sort of breakthrough that gets them, you know, grants and funding for future projects. It's, it's a shame that that's the situation, but I'm glad that, you know, you're able to break out of that and, and, you know, uh, dive into this world of, open sourced uh you know uh, collaboration it's pretty cool yeah and and then one of the things to find out about open source like a lot of open source projects there's limits there too in that a lot of people will go off into a corner and work on something for a long time and then publish the results that's open source but it's also not collaborative so so like when you when you talk about open source you want to make the distinction that okay is it open source but is it also collaborative as well those two things are really critical in the last Last couple of years, we, we've been just looking at, just finding out, getting amazed at how little true collaboration exists. Because even if you have some open source project, it doesn't mean that you can collaborate with them or they will help you to build upon it, whatever. So uh, I'm in this this game for life, so that's why I, I pay attention to like, okay, if it's useful, why do not we actually work together on business models that this could spread to the world so that we can make an impact? and that's the kind of game we're playing right now. And so how did you sort of, because it's such a large idea. It's like, what was sort of the founding thesis for you? What yeah. were those first few questions you asked yourself to get yeah. to this point? Actually, it's, it boils down to things like, so I come from Poland and, and actually my, my uh, grandmother was in a concentration camp. My grandfather wow. was uh, in a Polish underground derailing German supply trains. So we have that culture where war was part of our reality and then communism. And then I came to America. It's like, whoa, what a night and day shift where 
shelves were empty and everything was gray under communist Poland. You had to wait in line for food. And then you come to an American <laughs> supermarket and there's like a hundred of each item, which was just crazy. And I thought, well, what's the difference where, why does one country just have it all and another place doesn't? Like, what is the difference? And, and um, that made me think that, well, material resources are abundant they're common in many many places like you know, all the because all the wealth that we have in today's society comes from natural resources right so why is it that some places have it some places don't so i i was thinking that yeah it's about how we the operating system on top of those resources your politics your economics the way we collaborate how does that really work and that's and so i started thinking that well uh, if we collaborate openly and share that knowledge then we can bring everybody up and that was the simple simple equation you, you can have either deprivation or absolute prosperity for everybody and also knowing just basics of physics it's like we know that there's 10,000 times more power that comes from the sun that we use than we use today even with fossil fuels so there's like plenty of energy plenty of materials why are we sweating it mm -hmm. I got gotcha. you. And uh, for for the blueprints that you actually came up with, how, what was the di what was the process of of narrowing these down? I feel I could imagine like it'd be an overwhelming place to start trying to figure out what are the most fundamental technologies to make you know modern life possible. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it was a it's actually a page on the wiki. It, people can look that up. Uh, it's called the product selection metric. But essentially, it was any any industry or any product that had at least like a billion dollar market that was fundamentally important to okay how do we get our housing our food our transportation our energy and go through the list of known available technology so this is not about inventing anything new this is just saying let's open source those tools to make life easier for everybody so for, but also it, it came from a bootstrapping perspective as well uh, as soon as I got out of the college uh, got onto a piece of land in Missouri, 30 acres, and I found that my tractor broke. So I bought a tractor, then it broke. I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again, and I found I was, I was out of luck. Um, I noticed that the tools are not available to make it happen. So, so the first thing I noticed is, okay, well, I need a tractor. So let's design a tractor. I need a place to live. So I designed the the, the 3D uh, 3D printer, the the brick press, the the brick press to press soil blocks from the earth so the brick press and the tractor were some of the first first tools but basically going through what are the the main tools what are your needs like if you eat you might need a tractor to do some agriculture if you want to live in a house you got to get some construction technology under your belt so just went through all the obvious things that exist out there and said okay let's open source that so it's lower cost more accessible and lifetime design Amazing. And, and how do you imagine, you know, what's, what's your sort of, let's say, ultimate vision for this information being available to people? Yeah, ultimate vision, it kind of um, is really about um, how we have prosperity in America or in an advanced world. I mean, of course, there's disadvantaged spots everywhere, but getting the, the material security out of the equation of human existence so that we can focus on what's truly important to us. So right now, most of us are still in one mental framework. We're all stuck working on our nine to fives instead of doing the things that, are, that we're really passionate about. And, and even in the West, most of us are still pursuing things that aren't necessarily our best interest. Like more than 50% of people in this country don't like their jobs, things like that. So it's to address that issue of, of having the time by removing the survival element from the equation and then making it life easy so we focus on what's really important that's kind of the end state there's details on, on, on how that could play out but but the philosophical viewpoint is let's free ourselves from the toil of survival which you'd think we would be there already but that that myth of technology is, is still here it's like we've got the most outstanding and amazing technology around us but most people are still so busy and not really focused on what's important to them yeah. yeah, and so so you're saying that a lot of people are more focused on trying to 
you know, get the products that they need to survive or, you know, replace by just purchasing outright, you know, the new this or that, uh, rather than focusing on living, you know, more wholesome life with the people around them. Well, it's, and, it's, it's about the cost of living. Like the cost of living yeah. is, is tremendous and, and you, you, you have to go to work so that you can put a roof over your head and food on your table. I mean, that's still, if you think about that, it's like the primitive state of survival from millennia ago. You're, you're just trying, trying to survive. And right, right now we've got iPads and computers to make life better. But, I mean, it's still um, too much time is spent on just that equation of making a living. Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I was actually just thinking this last night uh, about how, you know, in our modern world, we, we think we have, you know, many luxuries that, you know, uh, you know hundreds of years ago, you know, they, they would only dream of, you know, mm-hmm. a, lot, a lot of times, uh, you know, or, or it's interesting to compare it to maybe like a serfdom kind of setup in, uh, you know, Europe, you know, hundreds of years ago, yeah. where, you know, someone would be given a certain plot of land to work that land, uh, and you'd have to, you know, give away a portion of your crops then you could survive off a portion of the crops Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know living that kind of lifestyle seems now when you look back it seems like so barbaric and then the more that you think about the way that we live today where many people are taking out you know 30-year mortgages on a home and they go to some uh you know they go to a a job where they're mostly you know doing some sort of digital work some sort of knowledge work uh to you know earn the income needed to just pay for their cell phone bill pay for their electricity pay for their mortgage pay for all these uh, variety of things where they never really get out uh, from underneath that sort of setup they do that for you know 30 years or whatever until they eventually start to own some things but then you know oftentimes the best part of their life may have already passed them by yeah um, and yeah, it's strange it's- to think that you know in the modern era we really you know are not too much farther off than we were hundreds of years ago in terms of our free time, I mean, yeah, I mean, there were definitely victories that, you know, we didn't have like this slave-like labor of people working in factories all day and night and child labor or whatever, or slavery. I mean, it's all better, but still at the same time, just what's possible with technology, the, the ridiculous productivity that, you know, like one farmer can feed like a thousand people or whatever, you know, you have this yeah. thousand acre plot and this big tractor and you make the entire harvest happen in a day or two. I mean, it's just unprecedented pro- productivity on, on all fronts. Yet, because of the way we structure society, it's so complex and the way it's designed, the wealth is extracted and typically um, leads to still the the bad distribution of wealth. That kind of such situation is very well with us. So what do we do about that? So we talk about let's reskill people let's avail the tools of productivity to everybody so that we don't have this this mega corporation producing cars like gm how yes. about the open source micro factory in every community where each community could produce just about anything that they need like uh, the vision like there's a vision called fab cities where people talk about what about what if all the cities made all the things that they used cons- that they consume so basically the distribution of power from the um the centralized state of today to a much more distributed one which is actually more efficient and better for people and people have time and the ability to decide what they really want to do not not like oh i need a job you know yeah. no i think we need to unjob we've got the amazing technology um but it's uh it's definitely shortcomings to how we're using it that there's still a lot of issue with people attaining their sense of freedom or liberty. And right now, like if you turn that into the political scene right now, uh, basically one of the things that are happening is you've got this this intellectual class and the worker class kind of deal. I mean, <laughs> where the people, the intelligent people, the privileged people have so much... Um, they don't work with their hands anymore. They don't produce anything. So they, they live in this virtual world like college teaches us to do if we're on the topic of college. Uh, but then we find we're so far removed from like very basic survival. And then and we relegate all the dirty jobs to to the uh, to create this polarization in an economic system where it's where it's like the working class versus the elite class kind of deal. Um, yep. that's that's right now causing a lot of troubles, you know. Yeah, and and I mean, I always think of it just from the you know the perspective of just overall human satisfaction. You mm-hmm. know, like being able to know 
the components that make up your life and know how to fix those components and oh, being yeah. able to, you know, work with your hands has a certain level of satisfaction to it. Um, I actually just had um, a gentleman named Joel Salatin on my, uh, on the show here. Oh, no kidding. Uh, are you yeah, familiar okay. with Joel? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Polyphase Farm and we were talking yeah. about that exact thing where, you know, uh, he has people that there's almost like digital refugees coming into yeah. his, uh, you know, apprenticeship programs and working with their hands and building something tangible for the first time in their lives. And it's, it's, such a you know wave of relief and joy for them that uh you know most modern people just don't get from their uh you know digital knowledge based jobs that you know don't really provide that level of satisfaction anymore uh yeah you mentioned the you know the self-sustaining cities the you know sort of like these micro environments where we could have that how do you, i guess one of my uh questions is how do we deliver the yeah, you know, how do where do you where do the materials come from in the first place? You know, obviously for most of our modern luxuries, there are some. You know, there's there's a mining uh, economic structure of pulling these materials out of the ground. So mm-hmm. how how do the materials get to the you know to the people in the first place and outside of the hands of you know typically in some sort of yeah. mining situation, you need a government behind it. You need you know funding to pull those materials. You need investments, and then you need to distribute those to large industries who can you know, uh, do something with those materials, those raw materials to make them into more useful parts. So we're, how, how do we distribute that end of the, let's say, uh, supply chain? Yeah, how does that work? We still have to get resources out of the ground because the, all the, the rocks, sunlight, plants, soil, water, that's the life stuff of modern civilization. That doesn't go away, but the question is, how, how would you do it? Uh, you would still need operations like that, and if you have, say, maybe the mega mega mines, they can be distributed too. Like, interestingly, like just to give you one example, so uh, we're we're developing OSE chapters of open source ecology in different locations, and so right now we're we're working on one in South Africa, and very interestingly, there the guy actually started a a mine to refine uh, chromium metals. It's like so it's. So that's an example. Yes, that kind of stuff still will exist, and it can exist on different scales. So we can do it on a large scale or a small scale. It's it's doable. Now, as far as you can also tap into the recycling stream. So when we talk about cities that produce all that they need, a lot of that could come from the circular economy, where uh, there's better built-up infrastructure for cyclic material flows. So for example, the, the metals you can melt back down in a foundry s- system or, or furnaces. Hmm. Looks like we cut. Hey, Martin. So sorry about that. Yeah. A little bit I'm of connection say, issue there. I don't. I don't we, see your. Okay, there you go. There you go again. Mm-hmm. Where did I cut off? Looks like. Um, so right when we were talking about how to distribute the, you know, sort of the mega mines, you were going to mention something. We can just start up there and we'll let's, it all together. Let's start with that mega mines. Let's take steel, a super common element. Well. That has to be mined. If it's, but if it's already, if you take the example of steel, if it's already mined, then you can talk about circular supply chains where then you build in the foundry system or then the furnaces that melt it back down, just like uh, re- in a sense of recycling. So we don't have to go back to the earth to dig out more. We can do more of that, and that's the circular economy concept. But um, there's no no evil to doing that, like say mining. As long as you're being, I mean, because we got to have some resources, but you want to do it responsibly. So maybe not like large scale strip mining for coal. What if, okay, so now take the coal example. What if in a future economy, we're developing technology to the point that hydrogen energy is feasible. So we're splitting water instead of uh, burning coal, we're burning water or burning hydrogen that comes from water. Mm -hmm. So there's always the, the question of how you're doing the technology uh, do you do it in a centralized, polluting way that's that causes environmental and social issues, or can you do it in a in a more benign way? And the, the, 
the, how I've been studying a lot of this, it's like there's a there's a an equivalent or some kind of a substitute for just about anything that you can do something in a in a really bad way or do it in a really sane way, like you know with the with the renewable energy as an example, or cyclic material flows like in a in the circular economy or organic farming instead of huge centralized animal feeding operations like Joel Salatin. Yeah. Um, so there's there's different ways of doing things, and the idea is that you distribute that more and have more places build up the knowledge set because it's really that's technology technology is the knowledge set that allows you to take those abundant resources that are everywhere and turn them into your modern standard of living so just like right now we for example have a hard time uh we re- are really reevaluating whatever we're shipping from china before say to make tractors or 3d printers like we're going to stop that it's like let's build more from the ground up and that's that's what the call for open source collaborative technology is that that knowledge becomes available everywhere so not just one good company makes the best product and competes and hides it and patents it but everyone has access to it so you can raise the bar get the quality up get the cost down and another big factor is like we talked about you mentioned about black boxes that you don't know how anything works well if you do know how to yeah. how things work if they're made locally and you can keep them alive forever you can repair it you can recycle it and therefore the lifetime design aspect comes out of this more benign economic form based on open source design it's it's an amazing thing because it makes a lot of sense and it seems like it would improve everyone's you know or the people that live uh this way improve their overall uh, satisfaction with life mm-hmm. but the it, it it appears to me that the the biggest uh, obstacle, the biggest hurdle, is you know it's it's shifting people's values mm-hmm. and shifting the overall uh, the way that business works in the United States to you know betray the bottom line. You know, it seems like we, right. we have you know we, we treat the bottom line as the end all be all, and to mm-hmm. do anything besides that makes no sense. Whereas in reality, we're, we may be driving ourselves insane uh, in that pursuit of the bottom line. Right, and a comment on that is it's. When I first started, I thought that, well, maybe it's like, why don't we have this amazing prosperity everywhere on the planet? I thought, well, maybe the technology is not good enough. So I started building this stuff, and I found that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. Like, the, there is no limit to the kinds of things you can do, especially with modern age digital fabrication, 3D printing, CNC machines, and all that. There's that's not the issue the issue is our mindset and that is that competitive mindset the the lack of uh we call it collaborative literacy but idea of can we work together with others can we actually share can we take on a mindset where we we base our business models not on scarcity or on creating scarcity because right now the status quo is we create business models that enforce artificial scarcity they depend on things being scarce we make things scarce but that's that's one way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. I understand that. Yeah, it's um, and and how about uh, in relation to, you know, like uh, if you're able to produce goods cheaper and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, p- everyday people are able to produce these goods. It's like how do you you know convince people of the quality over the quality of what's manufactured by some you know a specialist or, or a brand that produces that full time. Yeah, you would have to, do, I mean, as far as the open source, so so let's clarify that open source is a development method, so it's a collaborative development method, but idea is that you would have to get all those things in place as well. Like, say we start producing diesel engines, they'd have to be certified and, and proven and quality controlled. So you build that, all that infrastructure, but if you open source all the blueprints, documents, and all of that, um, you can that can actually help you. You 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 do that through a collaborative process. So you still have to have the the quality control, and <clears throat> all the elements of what makes a product work. It, but you're doing it in a different way, where simply people have access to it and it's transparent. Mm-hmm. I understand. And and also one point that we didn't touch on is sort of how uh, you envision these uh, technologies to be buildable to more of like a Lego method than the way yeah. that we have right now. Can you touch upon that? Definitely. <clears throat> so in my TED talk, I mentioned that we built a tractor in six days. Well, we actually did better. We did one in two days. Wow. Uh, and how do you do that? 
So the idea is it's called module based design. So think about a tractor being made of different modules. So there's the frame, there's the power unit, there's hydraulics, there's wheels, there's drive, there's controls. What we do is we, we design it such that each of the individual pieces can be built independently. Uh, so, so we do crowd-based builds like the tractor. We can take 12 people, you know, say you got six, six people in teams of two working on the different parts. So you build those individual parts and you, then you assemble them r rapidly into place at the end. So it's, it's the idea that you're, you're breaking things down into things that you have defined how they fit together like Legos. So to give you another example, we run extreme build workshops where the house, actually house that I live in right now, uh, that was built by 50 people in five days. Now how do you do that? So you basically break the house down into a bunch of four by eight foot panels. We built all the panels in the workshop and then assembled it pretty rapidly. So module based design is the key to some of this Lego-like construction which allows you one much faster build but also a construction set approach where you can build many different things like if you have the parts for a tractor with similar parts you can build a bulldozer a backhoe and other machines because uh, you interchange parts it's incredible and, and i i encourage people to I, i'm i'm definitely going to be googling module based design after this but just that way of thinking in general is so powerful it's like the uh i think there's it's the principles of differentiation and integration right the idea of if you you know understanding something fully is being able to understand it as a whole and also as its component parts and knowing how those fit together as a whole and yeah. i think you know that that perspective on on building and engineering and especially you know building these kinds of uh tools is really it's something else it's really phenomenal yeah yeah it, it does uh the modular design part is a really good good way to go as opposed to like this monolithic design where say one part breaks you kind of have to throw out the whole thing yeah exactly and that's sort that's certainly the world we live in today and and or if one part breaks there's no chance that you as an individual can fix it you need to bring it to a specialist sure sorry we're actually off grid in this house here so i have to turn back to grid power okay oh no problem yeah uh, do you have uh you have solar panels over there yeah yeah so this is the cd eco home i could actually yes i'll send you a link afterwards but this is the house we're off grid here but we're also connected to the grid as well so that's that's actually the kind of house that we we'd be building at as i mentioned that we're we're launching this kind of a house model that you can build yourself we're launching that as a major project next year that's, that's incredible. incredible i'm so uh i'm actually in the solar industry uh we were a solar uh you know residential solar uh you know we sell and install the panels for many homes and uh, you know, it's very cool. Huh. Uh, I just love the idea of being off grid. I wish more people could uh, could experience uh, you know that reality. You, you it's really just about the batteries. Yeah, yeah. You still do that right now? Yes, yes that's my business right, right now. It's oh, called right. Better Earth. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So you know, it's very much in that same vein there of you know being self sustainable. You know, uh, achieving freedom from the centralized you know authority there, which for many homeowners is their utility company with rising utility prices and so forth every single year so yeah energy independence is, is a you know amazing thing that's why i love the idea of really anything where people can free themselves from the sounds so dramatic maybe like the corporate overlords you know uh dealing with providing all of your essentials from amazon i think it would be much more fulfilling for people to be able to understand where their essentials come from being able to understand how to build them themselves and uh it's overall it makes for a much different lifestyle yeah yeah so uh tell me about the homes i'm, I'm very curious i actually just read an article today about uh something somewhat similar where they're working on building with innovative building methods uh you know a home for twenty thousand dollars or you know, fifty thousand dollars being able to build something for much cheaper than the way homes are built today and that one of the major constraints is the zoning requirements Could yeah yeah, yeah. is that a company things? that's actually doing that or is that just uh, i think it was a i think it was a, a university uh project i could pull up the details oh was that like was, i know university of auburn university of alabama they have this, i believe uh, so yeah the rural studio was that I, I, I believe know, so, so yes that sounds like that well so what we're trying to do is uh so we build this house in a workshop setting 50 people um over five days which is 
that's pretty amazing. I just watched a video of that, and it's like day one. Like in one day, we can put up all the walls. Second day, like roof, and then interior utilities. It, it wow. blows your mind. Uh, that's module-based design. But we're taking the learnings from that and teaching people how they can build a thousand square foot house that costs fifty thousand dollars that they can build themselves with a friend in one week. So that's, that's truly amazing. amazing. Yep. So we're actually gonna host a big collaborative event where we're going to swarm on basically documenting all the aspects of that including the business side of how do you actually run a business doing this thing um, but I guess the unique well, there is a little catch to it in the module based design the idea is that um, we say oh you can build this in one week with a single friend but you actually have to build all the modules ahead of time so every weekend you'll stash away a couple of modules so for for literally like a year, I mean, almost a year, you'll be mm -hmm. you'll be working like four hours or so on a weekend. You have to build four modules every weekend. Each each module takes two hours. Okay. okay. But after that, once you have them all stashed, then it it takes a week with you and a friend to install that to build that complete house. And it's it's a modern house. It's it's also got the off grid feature with the PV panels. Uh, but basically, the module based design. Uh, trying to make it really attractive. We're actually doing a flat roof, um, things like that. But 1,000 square feet, that's something you can definitely live in. And it, you can make it smaller. If you, you, you want to start with a uh, smaller unit, we're building it in modules of 250 square feet so that yep. it's, it's a manageable process. But yeah, really working out the details. We know, that, we know that this is doable. We've had enough builds here that we're confident that that could work. Yeah. And how does that work with, uh, you know, is it able to meet the requirements of modern day zoning? Because I, I mean, yeah. I mean, also in the solar end of things, you know, there's uh, endless red tape to fight through anytime anyone wants to do construction on their home or do anything. You have to meet all these building code requirements, which are, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lengthy amount of red tape. How do you deal with that? There's uh, so to begin with, the house is designed to be code compliant. Then the question is, OK, can you meet the, the, the inspection schedule on that? Because. If you're building these modules, like for example, if there's an inspection on a, in, on the house wrap, well, the modules already have the house wrap built into them. So there's some tricks like that where you have to, we don't know how to do that. We haven't figured out exactly the details of how that works, but we'll have to work it out so that we, we basically design a module such that they're inspectable. Like I know that you have to do the, inspect the foundation and you got to inspect the roof, you got to inspect the insulation, the framing. So we're going to have to fit that within uh, the regular zoning process, the building code process. I don't think it's necessarily um, impossible. The idea is, might be that instead of a person building that in one week straight, because you have to get the inspectors out there at particular yep. times, it might be okay. So you do, do this two days and then you get the inspector uh, who shows up like two weeks later, you know, or something yep. like that. And then you kind of might have to phase that out a little more. But that's definitely, like when we think about it, that it, that will be the main challenge. And we need a lot of legal support to pretty much first map out exactly what the uh, requirements are for each location, because this would be US-wide. Yep. And if we know, of course, that on the coasts, the zoning is, is tougher. In the Midwest, it's easier. So we might, uh, if we can't pull off the coast so we will start throughout the midwest between the two between the rockies and the appalachians but uh we'll have to make it work that's that's going to be a challenge yeah just for context for everyone out there you know the building codes in the united states are, are structured in a way where every single city and town has their own rules and there may be some state guidelines but ultimately the jurisdiction falls on you know your city town or county um, so every single one has their own set of details that must be adhered to, which makes innovation for, uh, you know, deploying something like house building technology nationwide incredibly difficult because uh, you're, it's unlikely you're ever going to be able to create some ultimate structure that is both cost uh, efficient and meets all the requirements of any area in the United States, any, any local building codes. Yeah, so there would have to be some customization involved and that's we have a plan for that that basically each house that we put out there there will be customization work to, for it yeah so when you say you have to build a, a module is that maybe like a room is that building some uh, it's a, typically a four by eight foot panel 
So think about a framed wall with two by sixes and then mm -hmm. just a piece of the wall that's that's four by eight feet. And that could be either a regular wall unit or it could have a window or it could have a door. But when you think about it, like when you break the house down, you've got yep. a foundation, you got a floor, you got walls, you got roof, bathroom, kitchen, utilities. Mm -hmm. So for example, for the utilities, that might be challenging, right? How do you how do you get all the utilities throughout the house? Well, the answer for that is there'll be a modular panel which includes most of the gas, heat, electricity, water, so that it's a very manageable small thing. And then, for example, how do you run the electricity to all the different rooms? Well, in a floor plan, you have a utility channel at the base of the of the walls that you can put that all in basically put all your cabling in there and if you need to modify things put your outlets in there as well so it's a it's a it's a module that you basically can do just just like that in a snap you don't have to go like into each each uh, wall module and put in your outlets and electrical mm -hmm. and other conduits it's all in, in these modules that that are self-contained in some way that's very interesting. How about uh, how about with plumbing? You know, another yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that I found very interesting is that there's someone working on sort of like a waterless toilet and yeah. that sort of idea. Because in you know, especially in the United States, everyone is connected to some sort of septic system mm -hmm. or, or to mm -hmm. the central water grid. You could say. Uh, how does uh, how do you approach that, that with work? your homes? So there's t the two options. One is the the version of the house with with grid connection. The second is without. In the grid mm -hmm. connection, so you've got a plumbing t t into the sewer. In the off-grid connection, you've got a biodigest. We actually have a biodigester in this house, where we we process the water to gray water level, and there, then after that, you send that outside into a gray water leach field. But uh, if you're off-grid, you we have we're actually using that right here, a biodigester that gets the waste both from the kitchen sink and from the toilet, processes all that waste. Uh, into gray water level um, so that by designing the sink and toilet it's actually got some plumbing in there that we use a macerating lift pump so it make it very modular there's a basically a pedestal under the toilet that sends all that stuff against gravity into the biodigester uh, so once again modularizing there's this toilet unit unit mm -hmm. that can do that for you so you're not you're simple you're able to simplify how you design the entire system. Got it. Um, and when you say biodigester, was that like a large furnace or something? It's a it's a 250 gallon tote of water with mm -hmm. certain plumbing that the all the wastes go in there. They decompose. There's a vent stack, so we're actually off gassing the gas right now. That would typically be connected to a gas bag that you can actually use that for cooking. We haven't gotten to that phase yet. We're still like about two years now, uh, still testing and working on the digester part, which which is working. Um, but we haven't put in the the biogas part, which is another complication. We're not including that in the initial model. But if you are going to be off grid, you can do this simple thing with a leach field, where you can process your waste. Now the other route, what we're going to include in the development for this. Um, this house is actually an ins incinerating toilet. So if you have electricity, Very cool. you can fry it. <laughs> wow. It's <laughs> a basic idea. Those things are expensive, but once again, through open source, uh, collaborative innovation, we'd like to make it so it's very affordable. And you can build that with the open source design. You can build this incinerating toilet relatively easily. That's the idea. You don't have to pay like, I don't know, it's thousands. I don't know how much these things are there. Last I checked, I think like a, a burnt and a serenade toilet is like at least like a couple of thousand bucks or five thousand. I don't know. Wow. Uh, but they're pretty expensive. It's not something yeah, you would just get. Yeah, and it's it's for you know I think for Americans it's hard to conceptualize like you know how how major of an innovation it could be if we're able to develop something along those yeah. lines for much much cheaper because we're so spoiled with our you know plumbing system. But in other uh, if you go to Africa, for instance, that would be a extreme breakthrough in quality of life where people are still mostly using latrines, Yeah. you know, uh, going to the bathroom in a hole somewhere. So it's pretty remarkable to think of what the op open source or innovation could lead to. Yeah, innovation, like that's the whole point with innovation on the house. Because we're making it completely open and, and you can collaborate in development, what about designing more ecological uh, wastewater systems like 
for example, have you ever heard of the living machines? Uh, that's I haven't. It's a biological waste processing system, but but more advanced systems where you're basically reclaiming the waste and then turning it in, into fertilizer and stuff that goes into your garden to grow food uh, in a safe way uh, by combining things like we did a, also an aquaponic greenhouse that could be used uh, like for example the the gray water from the biodigester can be feeding grow beds and things like wow. that in an integrated food waste management system so we haven't gotten that to that complete integration but that's why we're calling for open innovation with more people and more eyeballs on a product project we can solve bigger problems. Yeah. It's amazing. And um, one other area of the home that I'm curious about is, is uh, you know, airflow and, mm -hmm. you know, cooling or heating. Because yeah. one thing that's interesting to me is, uh, you know, in the modern world, we do so many workarounds and spend so much money on air conditioning, heating and things like that. Whereas, you know, the more that you study the way that ancient people would build structures or homes, they found innovative ways to design a structure to keep it cool or keep it warm using, you know, the principles of nature rather than yeah. relying on clunky machinery. What, what's your approach yeah. there? Yeah, good design for like cross flow, uh, just passive Passive, passive uh, cooling, flow. passive heating. Yeah. Uh, well, here we have a we just have a window air conditioner in the system, and we have a pellet stove. We also mm -hmm. have a we we put in a hydronic system where we have uh, hot water uh, circulating under the floor. That's also you can actually download that design if you want to build an open source hydronic stove. We have that design fully wow. documented. Um, but yeah, right now we're keeping it somewhat simple on that with a pellet. Like for the actual product release here, it's going to be simply a pellet stove. And put an air conditioner in your in your window if you're in a hot climate. And beyond that, I mean, if you have the off the ample solar power, you can run that off grid. If you have mm -hmm. ample solar power, you can run your incinerating toilet no problem. So that's uh, the low cost of PV these days, like like less than 50 cents a watt. I mean, most people don't recognize that, right? But the cost yeah. is ridiculously low right now, and you can afford to do things even like your your incinerator toilet with a PV system. That was unheard of like a decade ago. Yeah, absolutely. And are you uh, leaving some space for a future battery installation? We have a small battery. We just use eight motorcycle batteries, just kind of like a buffer system. So we're basically uh, pretty much running with the daylight. And when it, when it comes night, we just uh, connect to the grid because we've got a dual system here and just transfer mm -hmm. switch. Uh, but... The eventual plans on that would be, I mean, we're talking about hydrogen splitting water and, and we're definitely believers of the hydrogen economy of the future. So kind of push an envelope on clean distributed energy. I mean, um, I think hydrogen is going to be the, be the future as a clean burning fuel for everything from cooking to transportation. So um, eventually we'd like to switch over to that, but we're not there yet, obviously. So, Got it. Yeah, I, I, I don't, don't know, know too much about, about hydrogen um, compared to, you know, sort of the technologies of today. I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, videos and resources about the future of potentially a solid state battery. What, do you have any thoughts on, on you know, um, that technology? Battery energy density is typically less, like much less than chemical energy. So like for the, and chemical energy such as hydrogen. So if you talk about like grand classes of energy, there's there's electrochemical which is like 10 10x if you talk about the physics underneath it it's like 10x mm -hmm. less mass to to energy ratio like you can just get so much more out of that kilogram of hydrogen than you can get from that kilogram of battery you know so that's that's my thought on it now also but solar thermal storage in the form of superheated water it's called saturated water uh, not a lot of people know about this, but basically water that's above 100 degrees that's in a pressure vessel, uh, that also has a very favorable energy density, but not, not as much as, not as, much as uh, chemical energy like hydrogen or fossil fuels or whatever. Uh, so batteries, like we've got this craze of batteries right now, but I, I don't put a lot of hope in, in those as a long-term solution, like I say the lithium that's a scarce resource. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that there's ample water for what I mentioned, the saturated water storage and, and thermal energy storage. Um, and you can do solar concentrator uh, where you're actually evaporating water and running um, modern steam engines with that. 
that kind of technology like because the water route exists and the clean chemicals like hydrogen exist I don't think the future is going to be batteries yeah. have you have you looked at all into the uh, future of, of nuclear technology I had a uh, MIT professor Michael Short on the show at one point yeah. and uh, he described the potential of a future nuclear reactor that could be about the size of a shipping container that may yeah. be, you know neighborhood size you know to power a neighborhood of homes or something yeah yeah absolutely so when I was in back in grad school people used to joke um, uh, fusion energy so that's fusion is a form of nuclear uh, mm -hmm. it's probably what uh, he's referring to it's probably it's either fusion or fission but but the joke for fusion was that it's oh it's 10 years into the future it always was yeah. and it always will be yeah. so that's my uh, that's my take on it we have the sun 93 million miles away let's use that because that gives us 10,000 times more power than we use today uh, there is a fundamental like for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about the physics there is a fundamental problem in, in nuclear energies in, in that they emit neutrons and neutrons at the high energies that they're produced they make anything that they come in contact with radioactive and you cannot confine them with electromagnetic fields so there's a fundamental problem that um, maybe if someone gets an answer to that but according to human knowledge that's an intractable problem and I'm not saying that we won't come up with something in the future but if it's if it's like if you don't even have a hope right now that that it can work why bother there's I mean to me there's just easier solutions solar it's clean you're not gonna <laughs> your nuts yeah. are not gonna fall off <laughs> get radioactive I mean no the radioactivity <laughs> is a is you cannot get around that with nuclear reactions that's that's their nature and then also some people talk about uh, you know a neutronic reactions reactions that do not produce neutrons in their chemistry and yeah that's it's almost true but you will have s some not maybe not as much what they call a neutronic uh, means that there's gonna be some but not as much as the standard ways so there's no such thing like a zero or a hundred it's always a continuum uh, so we don't know that the, the nuclear problem or the nuclear issue yeah we haven't we don't know of a solution right now I understand. How, how far out would you anticipate um, any sort of hydrogen-based technology being readily available? Uh, I would say 10 years, not to say the 10 years of the fusion thing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's already doable. If you look at, so let me say like right now, even, uh, if you look at Google hydrogen fueling stations, they're on an uprise. Uh, hydrogen energy is a thing. That That is a growing industry. Most people don't know about it. I think we're kind of in a battery craze these days. But um, right now, the simplest way you can do that, I mentioned the low cost of PV panels. What is their cost per watt? What, what, what are the panels that you're installing costing when you um, get them from the source? My, all my math includes installation, uh, okay, okay. racking, all this. So stuff. let's say Google... Definitely Sun cheaper than before. Definitely cheaper than before. Let's get specific. Sunelect.com. Right now, you can go to sunelect.com and get PV panels for 40 cents, 42 cents per watt. Now, if you calculate that over the lifetime of the panel, you'll observe that you're getting two cent or even one cent, one to two cent per kilowatt hour energy costs. You put that together with what we know about electrolysis that you can break up water into hydrogen and oxygen, and you're generating hydrogen at an electricity cost of 63 cents. I just did the math the other day. Mm -hmm. But um, that means and a kilogram of hydrogen is about the equivalent of a gas gallon of gas. So you're talking 63 cents for the energy cost to generate hydrogen. People, that's cheaper than a price of gas. So you can take that hydrogen and burn it in internal combustion engines, which are a proven technology. A lot of people talk about fuel cells they're hard let's just say they're hard Got it. right now you can take hydrogen that you produce from your off-grid PV system at one to two cents per kilowatt hour generate hydrogen and this is your hydrogen economy done now obviously there's a gap there because that's not happening and you can yeah. have, you can you can guess some of the reasons why it's not not the industry's interest to make this happen this will come mm -hmm. from innovative entrepreneurship so all the people that don't don't go to college 
<laughs> of course. And to put it in perspective for people, um, you know, one to two cents per kilowatt hour is a unbelievably low price. Even in the best markets, uh, that's that's probably five x better than even the best uh, electricity markets in the country now. The average consumer in California is paying, you know, close to uh, twenty five cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, exactly, it's crazy. Uh, please look at there is the open source PV system page. I'll I'll uh, send that, but there's there's the math. You can look at my numbers and see if you argue any of them. This is this is. Uh, I would say the biggest thing is people are just not aware of this math or of this possibility or of the cost of PV panels. This, this is once again the idea that we have kind of lost touch with our ability to build real things and understand real phenomena here. Um, we're too far out into our specializations or not really seeing the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an inter such an interesting time for your business and for this project because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think as, you know... Uh, Things get shaken up a little bit, yep. uh, especially like even in California right now, it's bizarre how, you know, there's rolling blackouts, uh, you know, they, they can't really keep the lights on, you know, you, you realize that we're much closer to, you know, a more, you know, uh, let's say a much more challenging standard of living than, than I think people are comfortable with or used to just because of how consistently uh, we've been, you know, experiencing technological breakthroughs and improvements. That you know, it would not take much for these things to sort of slip out from underneath us uh, with bad management, you know, bad, uh, you know, or some sort of, uh, you know, 10x factor that could eliminate everything, whether you know, natural disaster or, or what have you, could make the living a much more challenging situation. Uh, and to have, I'm glad that you're out there doing this stuff, uh, making this this project happen, so that people can access these tools, access these blueprints, and ultimately, you know perhaps shift their focus so that if that time ever does come where, you know, we, we have to sort of dramatically change the way of life in America, we, we have a good starting place to, uh, you know, to, to build off of. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like you're saying, you know, us doing that work, but it's really about, this is the kind of stuff that if you, if you want to do this, yeah, you can. The idea is like we can all be incredibly productive builders and creators and most of us just have lost the touch with that I really encourage people to to get in touch with that more skill up to to start building real things because I mean in my personal life as it was just a complete transformation where I, I shift from being a passive consumer to an unstoppable creator I mean that's how I feel about myself right now I came from Poland under communism I didn't even know like private enterprise existed. Like I could say I was uh, pretty much enslaved in my own mind, but right now it's like having learned basic productivity with my own hands and some technology. It's it's just such an empowering feeling that that if you think there's pro like problems, okay, energy crisis or housing crisis. Oh yeah, the government's gonna fix it. Someone else is gonna fix it. No, it's up to us. We, we are the government here and we are the, the authority and it's up to us to seize that power. That's, that's the message for everyone. Yeah, it's up to the people to be the change makers, to go out there and, and you know, innovate in these places. I, I love the message. I, I believe in taking responsibility on you yeah. know, just about anything within your realm to do so. And uh, I think a lot of times we overlook some of the most basic areas where we could do that. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a powerful uh, message and a, and a powerful way to live. Yeah. Yeah. So where, where do you see or, or what, what would probably let me ask this? What, what would be the most helpful thing for your movement, for your, uh, you know, uh, project? What, where, where would you like to direct people or what could people do to sort of advance this cause? Yeah, we have a long page of getting involved from joining the dev team to joining workshops. But it's like we're actually a bootstrapping operation. So buy our products. Right now we're selling 3D printers. Actually, next month we're running a, a. It's called the Open Source Microfactory Steam Camp, where you can learn how to build your own 3D printer. We ship you the kits, build your own printer, build your own microcontroller, build your own 3D printed electric motor. So we're we're all about skilling people up. Uh, so if you want to get involved, join our dev team. But the biggest thing. Uh, you can support us with is buy our products or if you're really ambitious if you want to live this if you want to dedicate we actually have a way that you can do this full time so we're actually offering immersion training a mentorship where you can sign up for an entire year of of mentoring so that you get all this as much of the skills 
and techniques for starting OSE chapters that do what we do, which means run immersion education workshops, produce the machines like the 3D printers. So if you want to get it, dive into it, we have those opportunities. That's incredible. How, how, uh, how many people do you have uh, sort of around you right now? Uh, we don't. We don't have a, a staff team. So we're working on, on that right now, like for the housing project for next year. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to be looking at recruiting four full-time support staff. But basically, just now, it's pretty recent that we started to, to do the 3D printer sales. Um, over the last decade, it's, the learning has been, it's all, it's been a lot about prototyping and developing things. But right now, it's turning this into viable enterprises. So we don't have a team yet, but we're working on it. We're starting up the, the immersion training program for others to replicate. We have, I mean, if you talk about full-time equivalent staff and volunteers, we've got like four full-time equivalent of people who are contributing to the different design projects and, and other things right now. Well, it's a remarkable work that you're doing, and I really appreciate that you're doing it. I'm glad that there are people focused on it. I look forward to seeing the growth in the future, and I hope anyone listening is interested, you know, gets in contact and, and uh, joins the movement. I think it's a really cool thing, and I think also just... Not to be pessimistic, but I think there's going to be a dramatic shakeup in the next, you yeah. know, whether it's 10 or 20 years uh, to our modern way of life. And I think uh, you're well positioned on the other end to, uh, you know, as people want to reconnect with craftsmanship, as people want to reconnect with uh, the important things in life, uh, you know, focusing on time, freedom, liberty, uh, rather than, you know, sort of monotonous march forward uh, into, you know, dead end job. You know, I think, uh, there's a lot to be said about what you're doing now, and again, I appreciate you doing it. And I commend you for it. Thank you. One one last thing to add to that sure. is like, you know, China's about to overtake the U.S. economy. The only way I could see that not happen is if we unleash open source industrial productivity that's mm -hmm. taken up by many many people, communities building micro factories all over the place and reinventing modern digital production with with distributed open source technologies that's i feel like we could do a whole podcast just on that <laughs> but that's a that's a, a heavy topic but um before we wrap up are there any other asks requests or just message words of advice to the audience yeah no that's um i think i think we covered some good things i think the biggest biggest thing for me is to share that how I mean my life has changed absolutely upside down to, from feeling not so powerful to feeling like I'm a real change agent agent for the world and um, I think to see it you really gotta experience your own raw power of productivity so I encourage you to grab that <laughs> love it unleash yeah. your inner productivity take yeah. responsibility and, and you know start building stuff love it yeah. um, well, Martin, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors, and uh, I hope everyone you know takes the time to go check out, watch the TED Talk, uh, you know, buy the 3D printers, do whatever you can to support, and uh, and again, uh, truly best of luck in the future here. Love to see what's going to happen next. Yeah, yeah, love to see what's going to happen in the near future. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Martin. Mm -hmm. All right, I just wrapped up the recording. That was a lot of fun. I, 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 I mean, my mind's blown. Um, you know, I, I think uh, it's a pretty cool thing you're working on. So um, yeah, yeah. I'm blast this out to the world, and uh, you know, get, get yeah. So you said like a, about a about a couple of weeks or so. Yes. Yeah, so, so it won't be uh, this coming Monday. It'll be the following Monday, and I can have uh, my assistant there, David. I'll have him uh, send out the recording to this, as well as you know, he'll. I'll let you know as soon as we're publishing it. Yeah. You also get out like a um, social media post or so I could forward. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. of course. Yep. Yep. We'll Excellent. throw it on Twitter, Instagram, the whole deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so are you so you're doing the install, the PV installation? That's your full-time gig right now? Yeah. So I, I uh, started this company about a year ago with a yeah. few other people. It's called Better Earth. Uh, we we yeah, only we do it in California right now, but uh -huh. obviously we're working on expanding but you got, nationwide. But you got the Texas flags? Don't try oh, that. Uh, oh, this is, I mean, I, I guess this is just kind of a classic American flag. Oh, okay. I don't even know. It's, you know, it's kind of like War of 1812. And then I'm a Benjamin Franklin fan, so I, this was his ah. first, uh, first American political cartoon with uh, the Joiner die. Ah. But, um, yeah, ah. it's, uh, <laughs> I, 
I'm actually like in the process of uh, rearranging things, so I'm working on the the backdrops here. But yeah, overall, yeah, yeah it's um, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, tell me, tell me more about what motivated you to start the podcast, because I'm actually thinking of starting my my own. Well, I would definitely start one. I mean, uh, what motivated me was I just listened to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. So, you know, I listened to like a lot of Joe Rogan and a lot of other, you know, podcasts where you just get exposed to all sorts of different people, all yeah. sorts of different ideas. And ultimately, at some point, it's like, I just want to get into that and talk to people. And I, it's amazing how yeah. uh, accessible people are if you have a platform to share their voice with. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I could get there's some people that I've had on the show that I never thought that I would. Uh, or at least early on because, you know, they're busy people or whatever. But by just, you know, having a place where they're sharing, sharing their content uh, mm -hmm. and I'm able to help them amplify it, you know, it's like all of a sudden, you know, I get to have a conversation with them. And um, yeah. are you familiar with Tim Ferriss? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, so he's got an incredible podcast. And there was one line that really sold me uh, that he had in, in his where he said, um, you know, he's like, I get to talk to people like Arnold Schwarzenegger where I feel like I should be paying them to huh. talk to them and I'm actually getting paid to have that conversation because yeah, know, it's always marketing dollars and things like oh, that, yeah. advertising. So, so that to me was just immediately, you know, it's you oh, yeah. flip the frame and it's like, wow, yep. you know, you can benefit, you know, it's like a win, 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 win for everybody involved and yeah. you get to connect with a lot of cool people. So you bet. Are you monetizing this? Uh, I mean, because of my business is like really my primary focus, I don't put energy into monetizing this. However, you know, in the future, you know, we'll see, you know, if I, I, I feel like I'm more focused more on just like pure content at the yeah. moment rather than, you know, having uh, sponsors and things, yeah, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, we'll see, you know, see how where many, the future goes if there's the right kind of alignment. How many viewers do you have right now? Uh, I get a few, few thousand each episode, you know, yeah. some of the bigger ones will get more, you know, depending on, you know, the, the reach on, you know, get a retweet or whatever from some of the larger guests. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Now, do you have uh, any suggestions on other podcasts that maybe I should appear on other? I mean, uh, I would try and go for Joe Rogan, you know what I mean? Like, uh, that's definitely, that's number one going to get you out the most. Um you know, I don't know how, I don't even know the process of getting on there or anything, yeah. but I know that if you have a compelling story and a lot of, you know, you're doing something cool, you know, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able yeah. to. Yeah, it might be, Joe Rogan's a little bigger. Yeah. Now, um, maybe with the next year's housing project, the extreme mm -hmm. enterprise concept, that might be material. We'll see. We'll, we'll see how that You know who you could try and reach out to is, um, uh, and he actually got went on my show one time, is uh, Scott Adams. He's he's very accessible. Are you familiar with Scott Adams? No, I'm not. Who is that? He, he actually um, he's the creator of the Dilbert cartoon strip. Oh, oh. And um, now he's uh, you know sort of he uh, talks about politics and things right now, but he also has an interest in you know innovative technologies, and he does a daily Periscope, uh, which he you know publishes as a podcast as well. And he's the one that actually tweeted out the story today of the uh, you know the, the twenty thousand dollar house so uh you know you might be able to strike while the iron's hot and just send him an email i think he's very accessible if you contact him on linkedin um and you may be able to blast out you know just a little bit of what you're working on you know uh, and uh can you make an office. introduction i wish i could i mean i'd be happy to like send an email but i i don't know if i have sort of the uh the credit to do that uh, -huh. uh i'd be i'd be happy to uh i'll ask david to like send something over to him and say like hey i think you might like talking to this person well yeah um, like if i mean if he already appeared on your podcast you should have access because i mean if i'm a new guy he would yeah, yeah. have to go through yeah, that I, I um i'll i'll make my best effort at because i'd love to yeah. see it happen um and but i mean personally like you know just like from my own perspective hmm. if i you know don't have the the largest audience in the world, but he was very receptive to me uh, every time I reached out to him. So yeah, I would yeah. be surprised if he had a response also, especially given uh, the tweet he had today about the yeah. the uh, home. I think you'd really be hitting it at the right time. Yeah. Um, and then also, uh, you know, he usually has people on his Periscope for like maybe five, 10 minutes just to explain what they're doing. So it's yeah, not yeah. a huge ask on his end either. Cool stuff. Uh, any other, other guys? Um... You know, uh, that have podcasts any of your other guests had podcasts themselves or that's that's what i'm thinking about right now is you know some do but i'm not sure you know i talked to a wide stretch of people but what yeah. i can definitely tell you for sure is that uh 
I'll keep my eyes open. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll keep my I'll keep my eyes open. I'll talk to David and, and mention it to him as well. And if there's anywhere that we think would be a good fit, we're happy to refer you over to them. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So, uh, is is David volunteering, or is are you paying him, or uh, I pay him. He actually he, he lives in Serbia. So I actually yeah. for for my business and just for years I've worked with incredible overseas people that you know they're harder working than some Americans and most Americans I'd say and uh, a lot more <laughs> affordable so you know it's actually not a my model is pretty simple you know I have David who I pay you know a very reasonable amount compared to an American salary he works essentially part-time just prospecting guests to join the show based off of my interests yeah uh, and then we use a tool called anchor.fm if you hmm. want to check that out that's it makes if you post your podcast on anchor they can get distributed to like 10 other platforms automatically so you don't have to go through the hard work of getting it onto like the apple itunes store or anything like that it's all it, it's all set up to do that automatically hmm. makes makes it possible for anyone to have a podcast whatsoever hmm. um and you know and then i i just record over zoom like this i you know it saves the audio to my computer I upload it to a Google Drive, and David takes care of the rest. You know, it's really. Um, and how'd you find David? Um, I found David because I a uh, small network of people uh, overseas I've worked with in my previous solar company. But uh, there's a website called Upwork, where you could find yeah. if you're familiar with Upwork, you know, yep. you can find anyone to do anything on I there. And I normally it. just, yeah, it's yeah, basically they get you know if you go on Upwork, you can find somebody and then just say, hey, I'll, I'll just PayPal you directly. You know, and that usually works better for both people because then Upwork doesn't get their cut. You know, mm -hmm. you might get kicked off of Upwork if they catch you, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but uh, I would highly recommend it. It's easier than ever uh, before to have a podcast, but still early on where, you know, you can just get content out. And for you uh, and what you're doing, you know, it's like the more content you can get out, the better ultimately. You yeah, know, the absolutely. more that you can have like a digital footprint of, of your uh, of your efforts, the, the better. Yeah, definitely. On Upwork, do they do all kinds of endeavors, like all areas, everything. or is it every time? Yeah, you can find, you could just type in like audio. Can you do like CAD designers? Yeah, Computer yeah, you designers. can find CAD designers and stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. all sorts of, you can find just what, about anything there. What was your major um, feedback regarding quality control of people on there? Like, is it easy to find somebody that works out, or that's still a challenge? I mean, uh, it... It really, I would just say like when you talk to somebody, like when you interview someone off mm -hmm. Upwork, or Upwork or anything like that, you're really just looking for like an energy fit. You know, like if you find someone that seems kind of like low energy or something, usually it doesn't end up working out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you paint a good picture for them, you know, it should work out. I could even, you know, if you want, I could even try and see if like, I'll ask David if he has anyone that's similar to his skill set that mm -hmm. we're going to do the same thing. Um because, uh, yeah, usually the best thing is to find someone who's doing something like that, like uh, some sort of uh, digital, you know, virtual yeah. work, something like that, and then just getting a referral. That's yeah, yeah, like I, I have a I have like a 15 person team in the Philippines right now for my solar company. And it all started with one person that, you know, oh, wow. his sister and then sister's, you know, husband's buddy. You know what I mean? It's like it just goes on and on. And so, that's for marketing for the solar uh, they actually just do like little, they do logistical things for us. So like filing paperwork with the utility company or, you know, it's really just like a lot of things that Americans aren't very good at. I have one of them review all the contracts for accuracy and hmm. you know, pull data off of the utility bill. You know, there's all sorts of uh, hmm. small functions that you can have them do. Make Aurora, Aurora is like a solar design tool. They make like a solar design. So, you know what I mean? There's, you can train them to do anything. They're, they're very, uh, especially in the Philippines, you know, they, you could pay them five to eight dollars an hour and they're you know they're like well they're very used to working american hours uh it's like this whole industry called the bpo business processing online so you can find you know a million of them that, that will do dedicated work any hour of the day so for five to eight bucks you you're actually getting like level of work for that you would pay how much for in the united states like we pay uh, someone in the Philippines six hundred dollars a month, and in the United States probably have to pay them, uh, you know, four or five grand. So you know, it's it's a you know, it could be up to a ten to one return on uh, a Filipino team versus one American. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. 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 Interesting. I'll yeah. Look into there's that. a lot there, but the thing but, I've uh, I've been like when I looked into that, it's like uh, the thing that 
definitely is always a challenge is how do you vet the, the person initially yeah. like how do you get started but once you have that once you got some referrals that's probably a good deal yeah yeah i mean um i can also uh i could send what i send to people if you even want that like i'm happy to share that um okay uh, your your inquiry to potential uh outsourced well, work it's an assessment that we designed where it's basically oh. a um it's basically like a, a spreadsheet of data and we send it to them and say like you know uh transcribe this spreadsheet of data and so they'll type in name phone numbers e like addresses emails and things and you can tell it, it's to judge their attention to detail because mm -hmm. they may notice that the address was actually spelt wrong or mm. the uh you know email address was configured incorrectly like they'll they'll look for um you know you you judge their attention to detail and then the other thing i asked them to do is write me like a sales letter about better earth, like sell me better earth and then it judges their ability to go on your website you know, they go on my website they they learn it you know what i mean then they have to sell me you know write me like a page long thing about like a little sales pitch and you can judge their uh written communication you could also ask them to just write um tell me about yourself send me an email where you tell me a little biography about yourself and you can judge did they put a lot of energy into it are they you know trying hard huh. you know or are they are they just kind of you know just, you know just throwing stuff out there you know like how, how much energy did they put into it how's their grammar and they write well i would personally recommend trying to find people like like david is from serbia serbian people are unbelievable you know you're from poland you know eastern european people have an incredible work ethic uh very talented people um and very polite good with english uh you know it's philippines you'll you'll experience some cultural differences um, interesting you know, which, yeah let's let's fall i mean i'm basically like i'm at the stage where man this is time for the rubber to hit the road and then next year like yeah. with the i mean we're looking at we want to get two thousand of these houses out there so we're, we have one year to prepare but yeah. um it's going to be some organizational develop organizational learnings on my side so yeah sure. got to get ready for it have you seen what kanye west is doing in uh i think it's wisconsin who, that who kanye west no you know Kanye, the rapper? Yeah. He's trying to build, um, he's trying to also build some affordable homes. There, there's a, oh. you're really in the right place at the right time, I think, with oh, this, no uh, with the home building, because yeah. millennials are poor and can't afford houses. So in another 10 years or so, I think everyone's going to be living in some sort of, uh, you know, deployable living mm -hmm. situations, you know, so something you this can buy off Amazon or something. This Kanye West, is, is there a link or just Google that? Kind of Kind of oh, you could probably just housing. Google it. Yeah, like he's kind trying to build housing. homes. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then if you look up Scott Adams, uh, yep. If you haven't looked him up already, try and just you know message him on LinkedIn. Tell him th what you're doing with the housing. I really he has innovative entrepreneurs on all the time that you know ones that aren't always you know uh, you know like let's say far along or huge or whatever. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, a uh, best place LinkedIn. Uh, that's right. Yeah, like even I listen to his Periscope, and he talks about like you know he's very receptive to LinkedIn. Uh, you can email okay. him. Like he's he's pretty receptive, and I'll see what I can do with uh, uh, awesome. David no, that's, the communication, but happy to is, help any way I can. Yeah, this is great. So like uh, you know, was, I I got on a few podcasts recently. It's it's awesome. Like you know, meeting different people and getting some insights because I'm finding that the podcasters they're they're the curious guys. They're the guys about learning. You know. Cool yeah, it's stuff. asking questions. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's all the you know, life is about the questions that you ask yourself. Oh, right? yeah. So, you know, it's uh, that's what I like most about it is that yeah. even you know, I never even really considered like what the podcast would turn into. Mostly just like I just want a forum where I can ask people that I yeah I, I want to have a conversation with these people. So, so like you know, it's let me if you just turns out if you want to have a conversation with someone as long as you record it and publish it on the internet you can talk to anybody you want yeah just no, about. that's cool so, that's cool yeah it's all right cool. man well yeah thanks all right hey um real quick i want to ask you because yeah. i i'm going to record the intro for this after this yeah so it's marching and then what's the best way to pronounce your last name yakubovsky yakubovsky yeah let me see if i got this marching yakubovsky yeah perfect all right great excellent all right well um okay. thanks again good luck let me know if there's anything else we can do for you yeah and uh thank and, you uh, 
I'll keep track of your work and, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right, man. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya.